All right. Uh, so last week we had Stan. He talked about marginalized people. This week we're jumping back in to evangelism. And this is, I posted this early this morning um, to kind of introduce what we were talking about. I think this is one of the most misunderstood ideas in the church, just from my personal opinion. I think there are a lot of questions that surround evangelism and the idea of being an evangelist. So when you hear that word, when you hear, it, when you hear evangelist, who do you think of? Billy Graham, right? Massive, thousands and thousands of people. When you hear evangelism, all right, Sam, are you talking about, you know, when I leave a restaurant, I leave that little fake $100 bill on the table and that's got a couple Bible verses? Like, is that evangelism? Is it the televangelist who's on there talking about, you know, raise another couple million so I can buy a second plane? Like, is that evangelism? Is it the guy on the street corner? What, what is evangelism? And I think the church has really missed the point on evangelism and what it's meant to be. And so today we're going to look at defining evangelism so that we can understand it. And then we're going to look at this idea of, okay, well then who is called to evangelism? Who is meant to be an evangelist? What does that look like? How do I go about this? If, if I am indeed called to be an evangelist, and spoiler alert, you're all called to be evangelists, well then what's that look like lived out practically? We're going to dive into scripture. We're going to be looking at a bunch of different passages. Um, so before we do, before we open God's word, please join me in prayer. Father, Thank you for your goodness. I mean, you are good. You are the standard of good. You are the only one that's good. Jesus said, only you are good, and we thank you for that. And so now, as we open your word, Lord, one, we thank you for it. Two, we, we, we just praise you for giving us your word so that we might see your heart and know you, and then we might see the standard that you've called us to. And two, Father, we ask that your spirit would take us deeper in understanding and truth, that you would teach us beyond what we may think we're capable of, that you would open our eyes. Lord, I ask that these would be your words. If there's anything in me or in them of me, kill it. Just, just squash me entirely in this, God. Uh, if these aren't your words, then they are going to fail miserably. And so please speak now. Lord, we want this time to be an offering that is pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's one of the, who's preached the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Who's heard that? Right? Really? More of you? Come on, wake up. Who's heard that? There we go. I've grown up in the church. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. And I fully confess to you today, and I'm not, I'm not saying this lightly, I, I legitimately confess, there have been times in my life where I have said this, and I have treated this like an acceptable standard. And I want to address this idea today, this idea, Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. To quote one of my favorite philosophers, false. Just, just straight up false. First, and most easily false about it, is that Francis of Assisi never said this. <laughs> like, one, he, he never even said this. So it's kind of comical that we attribute this to him. The closest he came, he was writing about the idea of lives of integrity, and he was writing about the idea of, you know, putting into practice what you say you believe. And he said, talking about the monks and the friars, he said, let all the brothers preach by their works. But that's it that he never said preach the gospel at all times if necessary use words. So one, it's just statistically false, or logistically, I don't know whatever that means, but it, he just never said this. And then two, the idea of preach the gospel if necessary use words, that's impossible. That, that's absolutely impossible to preach the gospel, to proclaim the gospel without words. Evangelism, see, biblical evangelism by definition is a proclamation. In Timothy 4, 5, 2 Timothy 4, 5, it says, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Okay, well, so then what's the ministry of Timothy? Well, when you study Timothy's life, his primary gifting was as a teacher and a preacher. His primary gifting was a verbal gifting. And so Paul writes to him and he says, fulfill your ministry, do the work of an evangelist, proclaim. An evangelist is one who proclaims. So evangelism, by definition, is verbal proclamation. 
So this idea, this notion of preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel, just, you know, don't use words unless you really have to. They'd be like, all right, do me a favor. We're all going to do an exercise together. I want you all to breathe, but you can't use oxygen or your lungs. Congratulations, you all failed. Sam, click this button, but you can only use your ear. I want you to eat lunch today, but you can't use your teeth or your mouth or your digestive tract or your stomach or your throat. I want you to eat today with your elbows. It's impossible. You cannot proclaim the gospel without words. So why have we let, and this is again, this is where I confess that I have used this, I've quoted this at times in the past. Why have we allowed this idea? Because when I say I've heard this, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm willing to bet more of you have heard it than raised your hands. I think some people think their elbows are like, I don't mean it when I say raise your hands. Because I've grown up in the church, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that, man. I've heard it in sermons, I've heard it at Bible camps, I've heard it in small groups, I've heard it in devotionals. And some people get it right and they're like, hey, Francis didn't actually say this, but it's a legitimate idea. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter who said it, let's unpack this legitimate idea. And I think, this is my suspicion, this is my fear, I think the reason we have allowed this notion to remain in church, and I'm talking about church culture, I'm talking about Christian culture, I think that the reason we've allowed this idea of preach the gospel only using words if necessary, I think we let it hang around because we don't want to preach the gospel. And so we pat ourselves on the back and we feel better about, well, I was preaching today without words. And the reason I say this, I'm not, I'm not just being harsh. I'm going to be very real with you guys this morning. I mean, I try to always be incredibly real, but we're going to talk about some blunt statistics and problems in the church today. And not just the church today, the church over the last decades and decades. Barna. If you're familiar with Barna, they do studies on the state of the church in America and religion in America. In 2018, Barna asked Christians, how many of you are looking for or making opportunities to share the gospel? Okay, so are you, are you looking for opportunities to share the gospel or are you even going a step further in creating opportunities to share the gospel? They asked this in 2018. And when I say they asked this of Christians, I was a business major. I had to take way more stats and math classes than I ever wanted to in college. But I studied what makes a statistically viable survey. And so when it says that Barna surveyed Christians, what it means is they surveyed enough of an age bracket, right? They surveyed young people, middle-aged, old. They surveyed a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of ethnicities, a diversity of cultures, of incomes, of ages, of gender. Like, they studied a wide enough spectrum of people and got responses from a wide enough spectrum of people that they were able to say with statistical accuracy, this is indicative of the American church as a whole. Okay? So they asked the American church in 2018, how many of you are looking for or creating opportunities to share the gospel? 81% of Christians said they are not. 81% of evangelical Christians are neither looking for nor making opportunities to share their faith. And before we say, yeah, that's indicative of the decline of the church, yeah, that, that's pretty indicative of where the church has fallen. Oh, let's hold up. Barna did the exact same study in 1993, 25 years earlier. And back then, it was 11% of Christians were looking for or, sharing, or creating opportunities to share their faith. So in 25 years, we went from 11% to 19%. Less than 20%, less than, let's put it in very real numbers. And I'm going to use, I'm not, I don't know anything about, but I see five people right here. So we've got five people. One, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, five. Right? So yeah, that's, I can't do math. This is why I didn't like statistics classes. But we've got five people here. We have five Christians representing America. Less than one of them is intentional about sharing the gospel with people. Look in your row. If you have five people in your row, less than one of you is intentional about sharing the gospel. And that's an improvement. What is wrong with us? And that's why I think we allow this idea of preach the gospel of necessary use words to hang around in our culture. Because I can pat myself on the back and say, well, I was nice to my coworkers. I preached the gospel. No, you didn't, Sam. Proclaiming the gospel is inherently verbal. 
And I want you to keep that in your minds as we continue to go through. Because as we'll look at, not only is it inherently verbal, it is the model of Jesus' ministry. Jesus in Luke 4.43, but Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus said, I must euangelisai. And that is a form of the word euangelizo. Euangelizo. Anyone want to guess where we get our word evangelize from? So Jesus said, I must euangelizo. I was sent for this purpose. This was my purpose in coming was to euangelizo. And euangelizo means to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus' purpose was to evangelize, was to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God. I was sent for this very reason. I must go and do this. Yeah, but Sam, that's Jesus. Surely I'm not expected to... Oh, Jesus also said this is our command. Oh, shoot, there goes that argument. Because Jesus said, I was sent for the purpose of evangelism. I was sent to proclaim the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then in Mark 16, 15, and Jesus said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This was Jesus' mission. This was Jesus' mandate to us. Was to evangelize, to proclaim, which as we just established is inherently and necessarily verbal. And this is what Jesus laid out as the standard. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, go out into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation by being really nice to them. Use words if necessary, Peter. Use words if necessary, John. Jesus said, I was sent for this purpose. I'm sending you for this purpose. You can't, you can't get around it. You can't avoid it. But maybe, maybe we still have hope. Who, who's actually meant for evangelism, Sam? Right, isn't that your job? I mean, goodness, we call him preacher. Like, that's why you're hired. That's why we hired you and James. You're the preachers. You do the evangelizing. You're, you're partially right. I 100% have a responsibility to evangelize. 100% without a doubt, my life is meant to be given to proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. But it's not because I'm in a pastoral role. It's because I'm a follower of Christ. Listen to these verses. Who is evangelism for? It's for every single person in this room. You are meant to be an evangelist. Make no mistake. Listen to these verses. Acts 8, 1 through 4. And there arose on that day a great persecu persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, so the church... A great persecution arises against the church. The church is scattered outside of Jerusalem, except the leadership... Now, what does verse 4 say? Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Other translations will say, those who were scattered went about proclaiming the word. So that'd be like if a great persecution arose in Mansfield, and myself and James and Esther and the elders, we stayed in Richland County, but you all were scattered outside of Richland County. And it says, and those who were scattered went about preaching the word. If they would have relied on the leadership, well, guess what? The leadership's still stuck in Jerusalem. Some of them in jail. No, the church was scattered and the church preached the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.20, and keep in mind these letters, these Corinthian letters, they're written to the church in Corinth. If you look in the, at the start of 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul's writing to the church. He's not writing to the leadership. He's not writing, they're included because they're part of the church, but Paul is writing these letters to the body of believers in Corinth. And he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Ambassadors sent. Ambassadors are sent ones. They are representatives of a kingdom sent to a foreign land. 
We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God sent to a foreign earthly land to make God's appeal to the people. 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Always being prepared to make a defense when anyone asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. So make no mistake, you see action. What have we looked at when we preached on repentance, when we preached on Holy Spirit fullness and empowerment? Make no mistake, there is activity required on our parts. But what are you defending? See, this verse is frequently used in apologetics conversations where we'll be prepared to defend a specific aspect of the faith. Right? Like if I'm, I'm talking to my coworker Mike, and Mike's like, okay, well, I've heard that the resurrection didn't really happen. Talk to me about that. I'm prepared. I'm prepared to talk to Mike about the hallucination theory. I'm prepared to talk to Mike about the swoon theory, the wrong tomb theory, the grave robber theory. I'm prepared to defend specific elements of my faith. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope you have, the hope that is in you. So what's going on here is that we are living such radically different lives from the world around us that they look at the way we live, they look at the way we treat people, they look at the way we work, they look at the way we love our neighbors, they love our family members, we look, they look at the way we love the people who disagree with us, and they see something different in us. Wow, when their house burned down, they responded differently than I would have. Wow, when they lost their job, they responded differently than I would have. Wow, that worker at, at the plant who nobody likes, they love them differently than I do. Something is different about you. What is this reason for why you are different? And that is what you are prepared to answer. Well, I'm prepared to answer the reason that I'm different. I'm prepared to point you to Jesus. I'm prepared to point you to the gospel of the good news of the kingdom of God that you see is in me because my life looks differently than yours. I'm prepared to get to the heart of the matter. I'm prepared to dive down to the core issue. That's what he writes to be prepared for. And again, this is a letter written to all believers. Corinthians was written for all believers. Jesus says, go and proclaim the gospel. Who is meant to do the work of an evangelist? You. And you, and you, and you, and you, and me, and James, and Esther, and the elders, and you, and you. We're all meant to be evangelists. I would love if when I said, okay, think of an evangelist, and you were like, oh, my Uncle Frank. And someone else was like, oh, my neighbor Ted. Someone else was like, oh, my husband, oh, my wife, oh, my kids. I mean, how great would that be if the church could say, when I think of an evangelist, I think of the people sitting right next to me. I think of myself. Because I know that I am proclaiming the gospel with my life, with my words. This is what Jesus modeled. This is what Jesus mandated. Who is an evangelist? All of us. Yeah, but can I really make a difference? Why, why is this essential? Why is personal evangelism so necessary? We've got you, we have James, we have, we've got the church leadership. Let's look at some verses. This is Romans 10, 9 through 15. Romans 10, 9, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Those are beautiful verses. Memorize those verses. That's an incredible synopsis of the heart of the gospel. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But now listen to these next verses. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching, someone proclaiming? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Let's work our way backwards. How are they to preach unless they are sent? Mark 16, 15, Jesus took care of the sending, done. Check it off the list. Jesus sent you. 
If you're waiting for a special invitation to arrive in the mail, this isn't Hogwarts, you're not going to get something on your 11th birthday, Jesus sent you. That part is taken care of. I don't care who you are, I don't care how old you are, you have been sent by Jesus to proclaim the gospel. So if you are not proclaiming the gospel, how are they to hear without someone proclaiming? And if they're not hearing, how are they to believe? But Sam, that's why we have... Stop saying that. Stop. Stop thinking... Yes, I said it's my responsibility. But let's do a quick mental exercise. Adeline and I will take your whole family to dinner, restaurant of your choice, order whatever you want. Shoot, order the whole menu. If you do not know one person different from me, does anybody think, if you wrote out everybody you know and interact with, and we wrote out everybody I know and interact with, you think those lists would be identical? No. Shoot, man, we'll stack the odds. We'll get James up here. We'll write out everybody I know, everybody James knows. We're the preachers. It's our job to proclaim. And then we'll write out everybody you know and interact with. You think there are going to be people on your list that James and I don't know and interact with? Yeah. So if you're waiting on those people to hear from me, how's that going to happen without your involvement? Who's one of your writer friends? Just give me a first name, hon. Kim. I don't know Kim. I, I have no idea who Kim is. So if Adeline is waiting on me to proclaim the gospel to Kim, how in the world is that going to happen if I don't know her? And I guarantee you there are plenty of people in your life who don't know me and whom I don't know and they don't know James and they don't know our elders and they don't know Esther and they're probably not attending a church, statistically speaking. I mean, statistically speaking, if you look at the pure numbers of people who legitimately have a relationship with Jesus, it's a minority. So I'm willing to bet you know way more people than you realize who have no relationship with Christ. And if they don't know me and I don't know them, why in the world are you sitting back waiting for me to be the one to introduce them to the gospel if I don't even know they exist? How are they going to hear without someone proclaiming? This is why personal evangelism is so essential. The prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We all know that. If you've been in church twice, you've probably heard that. What do we, what do we paraphrase that as? Our Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. And we treat it like a statement of praise, right? God who is in heaven, your name is holy. We praise you for this. Except that's not what the original language meant. The original language was very deliberately hallowed, be your. This was not a statement of praise. The word that Jesus used there for hallowed, you could also translate it as, it also means consecrated, sanctified, or make holy. So Jesus is not saying, God, you are in heaven, your name is holy. He is saying, God, you are in heaven, make your name holy in the land. It's not a statement of praise. It's a desire to see God's name lifted up and magnified in the peoples of the world. It's, God, you are in heaven, may your name be consecrated. May your name be holy. May your name be lifted up by the peoples and worshiped. How are the people going to lift up God's name if they don't believe in Him? How are they going to believe in Him if they've not heard Him? How are they going to hear Him if no one is proclaiming Him? So if we are not proclaiming the gospel to the ones we know and interact with, how is God's name going to be sanctified, lifted up and worshipped across the nations? if we're holding on to it like this is just for me and my own. Guys, if the church never wakes up to the necessity of ownership, I'm talking individual ownership, I'm talking you in the seat right now, shaking your head thinking, eh, I still think, no. If you do not wake up to the necessity of your personal responsibility for evangelism, you are missing out and ignoring a biblical mandate from Jesus. That is no small matter. 
I am convicted of this with the entirety of my being. Sam, can I really make a difference? That's, that's a lie. The enemy uses such... Oh, I, I get so... Uh, I just get angry. I, I, I just get angry at the tactics he uses. And he whispers, you can't make a difference. And when he says that to you, just, just tell him to shut up and go away. Anybody know who these two people are? How about baseball uniform? Anybody? Aaron Boone. All right. You were close. I'll give it to you. You get partial credit. So I grew up right outside New York City as a kid. I was a huge Yankees fan for most of my life. And I will forever remember this game. My parents let me stay up and watch it. 2003, ALCS, Game 7. Uh, incredible game. Yankees, Red Sox, most hated rivalry. And just a fantastic battle between these two teams. Mariano Rivera comes in. The game is tied in the ninth inning. Mariano Rivera comes in, pitches three scoreless innings. We now get to the 11th inning. Nobody in the New York area is asleep. Aaron Boone steps to the plate in the bottom of the 11th inning. He came in as a pinch runner in the 10th inning. He gets his first at bat in the bottom of the 11th inning. His only at bat of the game. There were 80, where to go? 80 five at-bats that game. Aaron Boone had one. That's 1.7% of the at-bats in that game. There were 338 total pitches. Aaron Boone got one pitch. He got 0.3% of the pitches in that baseball game. And on that one pitch at that one at-bat, Aaron Boone cranked the most beautiful home run down the third base line, and the Yankees won game seven and went to the World Series. You think Aaron Boone made his one shot count? What if Aaron Boone would have looked at his past? Because he was doing terribly that postseason. He was hitting 125 in that series. If you know baseball, you hang your head at that. If you don't know baseball, 125 is bad. Aaron Boone was hitting 125 in that series. What do you think would have happened? You think Aaron Boone's mind was, man, I'm a failure. All my previous attempts have gone terribly. There's no point in even walking up to that plate. I Everybody else had way more of a chance to have an impact than me. This is a waste of time. Maybe. We don't know what's going through Aaron Boone's mind. You think Aaron Boone was thinking about that after he rounded third base and ran towards home, knowing he just won the whole series for a season? You think he was thinking about his past failures? Aaron Boone made his chance count. How about the other man? That's Edward Kimball. Anybody know the name Edward Kimball? I would have been really, I would have taken you to lunch if you knew Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who taught a group of incredibly misbehaved uh, young men. By his own admission, the classes were mostly pointless because they were so disruptive. And there was one who was the ringleader. And, and one day, Edward Kimball became convicted. God convicted him. Maybe if you could reach the ringleader, maybe things would change for the whole class. So Edward Kimball went to where this young man worked as a stock boy in a shoe store. And he went back in the stock room and he spoke with this young man. And at that time, in that conversation, this young man became a Christian, professed faith in Christ. His name was Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody started an evangelist program. And a man named Frederick Meyer became convicted at one of Dwight Moody's meetings to start his own evangelist program. You guys know the name Frederick Meyer? Oh. Frederick Meyer starts his own nationwide preaching ministry. And at one of his meetings, at one of his sermons, a man named J. Wilbur Chapman accepted Christ and became a believer. You guys know Chapman? Oh, somebody said yes. Who said yes? J. Wilbur Chapman? All right. You don't have to raise your hand. That's impressive. Chapman becomes a Christian at one of Meyer's meetings. Chapman goes on to start his own evangelist program. He hires a young man named Billy Sunday. And he trains Billy Sunday how to do the work of evangelism. And he raises Billy Sunday up. And Billy Sunday starts his own evangelism program. And, and Billy Sunday goes down to Charlotte, North Carolina. And he has such an impact on Charlotte, North Carolina, that a group of businessmen, lay people, not pastors, not trained, they didn't go to seminary. We're talking average citizens were so impressed by the ministry of Billy Sunday that they started their own, they called it the Billy Sunday Layman's Evangelistic Club. And when Sunday left, they were like, no, no, evangelism has to continue. Evangelism can't stop just because the one guy went away. And this club of lay people committed to evangelism brought in a man named Mordecai Ham. And in 1934, 
Mordecai Ham preached, and a young boy named Billy Graham came forward and, saved, and was saved. And by 2008, I don't know the final numbers, but in 2008, they estimated that 2.2 billion people had been reached through Billy Graham Ministries. My dad was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. And it all goes back to Edward Kimball. Don't tell me you can't make a difference. Don't you dare let the enemy whisper that. Uh, the kids are old enough, that crap. Don't you dare let the enemy whisper that crap in your ear that you can't make a difference. I believe with all of my being that you can make a difference. Why? Not because of how good you are. I don't believe that I can make an impact because of who I am. I believe I can make an impact because of who empowers me. I believe you can make an impact because of who empowers you. Let's back up two weeks. Who has the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Oh, it's the hand thing. Come on, when I ask questions, I'm serious. Every Christian, every Christian has the fullness of the Holy Spirit indwelling them. What does Scripture say about this? Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The power is the Holy Spirit's. But the immediate impact, the immediate result is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So if we as believers today have the fullness of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be His witnesses. And listen to Ephesians 3.20. This is one of my favorite verses. Now to him who is able to do, I mean, listen to these words. Listen to, I'm going to say this slowly so you can pay attention to each of these deliberate words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine according to his power at work within you. Immeasurably more. Think of the biggest impact your life could have. 2.2 billion people. Billy Graham's ministry, 2.2 billion people. Think of impacting 2.3 billion people. And God's like, oh, I can do immeasurably more. Oh, you can't even, immeasurably, you can't even quantify how much more I can do than your little imagination can conceive of, according to his power. Why do I believe that this is the church body that could change our country? Because of his power. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. Oh my goodness. That would be the most ineffectual ministry in the world if it rested on my shoulders and my power. It has nothing to do with our elders. They're wonderful men. I love these men. I love our staff. It has nothing to do with any of us. It has everything to do with his power at work within us. This is why you taking ownership for personal evangelism this is why you taking a responsibility to proclaim the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, this is why that is so essential and why it can be so powerful because it always comes back to God and to God's power. And that's phenomenal to conceive of. I, I mean, that's just such a joy. And so I don't want to just leave you with the conception or the conceptual ideas of evangelism. I want to look at some practical ideas here. This is Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. He says, pray that God opens doors for me to declare the gospel, because that's how I ought to speak. And then he goes on and he says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person, or how you ought to answer each person. How should you answer each person? The gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus, the good news of a Savior. So when you consider practical evangelism, I realize this is scary. I, I do. I realize that this is a big ask. But you've heard me say it before. I, I don't believe in small goals. I think, I think they're pointless. 
I don't believe in setting low bars and then congratulating myself when I step over it. So I realize this is big. So practically, start by praying for open doors. There's this temptation. You talk about lies the enemy whispers. God, God is always moving, always working, and the enemy has convinced us that no, he's not. He doesn't really do these crazy stories that you hear of, right? Ah, oh, it's so wrong. Again, tell him to shut up. That's such a lie. My dad has so many, my dad is the greatest evangelist I personally know. He's had more conversations with people about Jesus than anyone I know. Why? Because he's always praying for him and he's always looking for him. And he makes his students do the same thing. Every semester he teaches a class called spiritual formation. And every semester the class has the same assignment. By the end of the semester, you have to share the gospel with one stranger. And every single time he has students say no. No, I'm not doing that. I can't do that. That's not my personality. I'm not comfortable doing that. Multiple times he has people say, that's just straight up unbiblical. That's not, that's not how God works. He had a girl one time tell him, that's not how God works. I, I'm not personally convicted that that's how God works. I don't think he works that way in strangers. It's all about relational, right? Incarnational ministry, it's all about building a relationship. Then you earn the right. No, Jesus earned the right for you to tell him the gospel. Jesus sent you to tell him the gospel. This girl said, I don't believe that. My dad said, okay, well, do you accept spiritual authority? She said, yes. He said, all right, I'm, I'm in spiritual authority over you. I'm telling you to go do this. She waited until the last week of the semester, and she set out the whole time telling my dad, this is a waste of time. This is going to be pointless. All right, go do it. Pray for open doors and go share the gospel with a stranger. She wandered the city of Nyack, wouldn't talk to anybody, kept saying, nope, I don't think this is how it works. So finally she wandered down to the river of Nyack. There's a nice walkway. You can look over the Hudson River. She saw a woman sitting on a bench. She went up to this total stranger. She's like, fine, just so I don't fail, just so Ron doesn't fail me, walks up to this total stranger and says, hey, can I talk to you about God? And this total stranger bursts into tears. Says, I've been sitting here for hours asking that if God was real, he would send someone to talk to me about him. My dad did it again. I mean, every semester, just this past semester, he had a kid tell him, he had a guy tell him, this is crazy, I don't do this. I'm an introvert. This isn't my per. this is nuts. No one wants to talk to a stranger about Jesus. I said, great, I don't care, go do it. A homeless man came up to this kid and said, hey, can I have some money or food? And the guy said, I don't have anything I could tell you about Jesus. And the homeless man said, okay. And they talked for hours about Jesus. And the kid went back to his car to get him a Bible, his own Bible to give to the homeless man. And he found money in the car. And when he came back, he said, hey, I've got a Bible and I've got money. And the homeless man said, no, 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 keep the money. You gave me something better. And he walked away with the Bible. I've had conversations in Starbucks lines. I've had conversations in Barnes and Noble. Just this past Friday, I had to run an errand on Friday morning. And I came back and I said, Dad, I said, hey, we have to pray for this, this individual. One of her family members just suffered something. We need to pray for her and pray that God would use it. And, and Addie said, well, how would you wind up talking to this person? I said, oh, well, I needed help finding an item. She said, how in the world did Jesus come up in a conversation about bagels? And I said, oh, it was simple. I brought him up. I'm not a genius. It's that simple. God, open doors. Pray for open doors. And then let your jaw drop when he does. And then the other thing, too, is not just pray for open doors, but what does Paul say? He says, make the most of every opportunity, of every conversation. There's so many more doors open around you than you could ever imagine. I guarantee it. I've had conversations with people about Jesus that started with complaining about a spouse. I've had conversations with Jesus, or about Jesus with people who started complaining about jobs, finances, sports teams. There are so many open doors. This world is so broken and so grieved and so hurting and in such desperate need of a Savior. So Paul says, not only pray for open, he says, pray for open doors, but then pay attention to your conversations and make the most of the opportunities that are already open in front of you. So pray for open doors and realize, start looking for the doors that people are already holding open, desperate. I mean, the woman on the bench praying, Lord, if you're real, send someone to talk to me about you. There are open doors all around us. So make the most of every conversation. If you're talking to someone, it's not just a conversation about the errands or the projects they worked on that weekend. It's a chance to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And then finally, engage meaningfully. What does Paul say? He says, let your speech be gracious and seasoned with salt. 
Be wise in your conduct towards outsiders. Engage meaningfully. Go beyond shallow. When you're talking to someone, when you're talking to strangers, I mean, literally, like, I love having conversations with strangers. I had a guy in a Starbucks line one time. I said, hey, why don't you go in front of me? He said, why? I said, well, because I've got a whole big list for my whole office. It was back when I was at the practice. I've got a list for like 12 people. I don't want to hold your day up. He said, why do you care about my day? Holy Spirit said, hey, did you catch that? Well, Jesus loves you. And Jesus tells me to love you as I love myself. So I want your day to be as best as it possibly could be. He said, Jesus says that? He said, yes. He said, man, that's, you're kind of weird, but that's cool. I have no idea where that guy is today. Because see, that's the other lie that the enemy will whisper in your ear. When you're considering the, the tactics he takes to counteract this idea of evangelism in our life. The enemy will tell you, oh, you had a conversation and they didn't fall down and profess Jesus as Savior in that moment, you failed. Or you've tried it in the past and it hasn't worked, you failed. No, 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 what does, what does 1 Corinthians, is it 2 or 3? 1 Corinthians 2 says, Apollo's planted, I watered, but God did the growing. You don't know what your job is supposed to be. You might be the one who has the evangelistic conversation, who proclaims the good news of the kingdom of God, and then two years later someone else comes along and they water that seed. And then someone else comes along and they do some weeding. You have no idea where you fit into the scheme of things, but I promise you this, if you refuse to proclaim the kingdom of God, you have removed yourself from the process. Guys, this, this has to be a burden on our hearts. This has to be an inescapable, unavoidable reality for the life of the Christian, that you individually are meant to do the work of an evangelist proclaiming Jesus to the people in your lives. And then one last practical bit. Memorize this phrase. Seriously, memorize it. I don't know the answer. That's a great question. We'll find out together. Don't fake it. Don't try and make something up. If somebody asks you a good question, be honest. That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let's find out together. We've blown it up. See, I said, who, when you think of evangelism, who do you think of? And Billy Graham's name popped up, and I knew it would. But then the problem is the enemy uses that to whisper in your ear, yeah, you're no Billy Graham. And your response is, yeah, I'm not meant to be. So get out of here with that nonsense. I'm meant to be who God created me to be. I'm meant to proclaim the gospel to the people in my life, just like Billy Graham was meant to proclaim the gospel to the people in his life. This has to be a reality for the church. 81%. 81% of Christians have no intention of sharing the gospel. Before we start patting our back, ourselves on the back, we've got to consider the statistics. Statistically, we're way more likely to be in that 81% than in the 19% who take evangelism seriously. Please, you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit in you. What is holding you back from proclaiming Jesus? By all means, use your actions. Live out your faith. But use words if necessary. What a terrible concept. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words done. So this week, ooh, this is going to be a big ask. But like I said earlier, I don't do small, small goals. I want you to read Romans 10, 9 through 15 and Colossians 4, 2 through 6. We read both those passages today. They're small. You can read each of them every day. Just a few verses. So read those two passages every day. And you ready for this? I want you to create one opportunity to talk to a person face-to-face -face about Jesus. You run errands, go up to a stranger. You're in lows, go up to a stranger. You know what teach? I mean, if, if you can do it to someone you know, that'll probably make it a little more easy for you. Okay, I'm fine with that. But I want you to proclaim the gospel to one person this week. Why? Because that's what Jesus laid out. Sam, that's not how it works. I don't care about those stories of your dad's students. I don't care about your... Per that's not... Do you accept spiritual authority? And I feel really weird asking this. I, 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 I honestly do. This is still kind of odd for me. But if you accept spiritual authority, I, I have been placed in spiritual authority over this body. I will be held responsible for this. This is not a light authority. Trust me, the mantle of it weighs on me. I accept responsibility for this body. But if you accept spiritual authority, I am telling you as the spiritual authority entrusted to steward this body in this time, do this. 
I don't care if you don't think it's right. I don't care if you think that ah, God doesn't work this way. Do this. I'm telling you to do this this week. Pray, and the prayer is simple. Lord, open doors. And talk to one person this week. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus to one person this week. Yes, I can't. And then, and then share the stories, okay? I don't expect all of it. Like, I don't expect to hear from every single person. But I expect God to be moving. So share the stories. We want to hear the conversations you have. We want to hear what happens. Because when we share those stories, we serve as a testimony to one another to remind one another that God is always on the move. That God is opening doors. That His Spirit dwells within us. That we have the power to be witnesses. I am convicted of this with everything in me. And I'm telling you, the standard I expect is that you all will be proclaiming the gospel regularly. I'm putting that out right now. I, I didn't clear this with the elders. Don't get mad at me. If you have no interest in proclaiming the gospel, please find another church. I, I, I'm just serious. Because this is not something trivial. This is not something casual. This is, this is heaven or hell. So if you listen to all of this and you're like, meh, I, I love you. We can be friends. But this might not be the church for you. Because we're going to take this seriously, I promise you. So do that this week. And then let's share the stories of the incredible ways that God moves. Please join me in prayer. And this will just be, this will just be a dismissal. Um, I, I, just, I want this to weigh in, the gravity of this. Father, you sent Jesus to proclaim. You sent Jesus to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, and Jesus laid it out bluntly for us so that we couldn't miss it. And then Jesus said, go proclaim the gospel to the nations so that we couldn't miss it. Lord, forgive us for missing it. Forgive me. I mean, Lord, forgive me for every time I've missed it. Every open door I've ignored because I was too busy or too selfish or too scared or too intimidated. Forgive this body, Lord. I, I, Lord, forgive us. Forgive your church for missing this. And God, in this moment, right now, fill us with a burden, with a zeal, with a fire for evangelism. Fill us with a heart that longs to proclaim you, that prays earnestly for open doors, that seeks open doors, that looks for open doors. And if the doors aren't open, Lord, give us a boldness to kick them open. Lord, give us a boldness to kick these doors open. God, I, I hope not. I really, I really hope not. But I know I've sat in seats and I've listened to messages like this before. God, forgive me. I know I listened to stuff like this in college and in ministries, and I, I thought to myself, yeah, that's great for them. Lord, if there's anyone who the enemy is still whispering to, he's not talking about you. Just silence that voice. Lord, please. Please burden this body of believers to proclaim the gospel. All of us. Lord, break our hearts at the thought of people not knowing you and give us a burden to proclaim you. And Lord, open doors this week. Give this body stories to share that so clearly point to you. I promise we will give you praise. This has nothing to do with us. 
Give us open doors that we may share your testimonies. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Have a great week.